Alright, need to get this stuff recorded. Before I open these up, I did get to Switch games. It's a Ghostbusters the Video Game Remastered and Minecraft. Where I have the Wii version of this, kind of, it's almost a different game. I think it follows the same general story, but it's kind of set up a little different. That one's multiplayer, which is good. This one is not, but this is kind of a more authentic Ghostbusters 3 experience. Whereas Minecraft is, um, well, my mom got a Nintendo Switch, and I decided to help her purchase stuff. She was going to get Minecraft 4, and I also got a copy for myself so I can help troubleshoot stuff. But enough about that. Let's get this Thermodurbed Derpender. Okay, this one is still tight. That's not going to help at all. It is being a stubborn piece of shit, so we are going to get the fucky stubborn piece of shit scissors out. There we go. All dissolved. Well, this is some real bullshitty adhesive that we're dealing with. All right. Well, well, I guess beginning with the stop with the top here, we have Bleach Blu-ray set five, which I can't believe we're already at five. Although somebody did mention, I did they did somebody mention there may be a small hiatus was it for this? Was it for something else? I don't know. The important thing is, there's at least this, and I'll get next versions when they come out. Um, region A. I guess it says special features here. Art gallery, clean opening endings, Viz audio commentary, episodes 123 and 139. I guess this one tells us which episodes are on here. Episodes 112 to 139. Wow, that's a lot of it. Come out nice and... I say quick. Oh, look, they have different backs. But the same front. That's interesting. Not very common. Uh, there's more Orihime. Um, what are we dealing with here? We've got two Viz things. More information about them. I think we can go ahead and put this back here, since as adorable as that picture of Orihime is, I think we've gotten a good glimpse at it, and we only really need glimpses. It's not like this is an art class or anything like that. The discs themselves, pretty straightforward for them. That is a lot of text. No, not like a lot, lot, but... Hmm. Interesting, is it intentionally an image within an image? I think so, but it also doesn't look right. Anyways, let's go to the next one. Meiji Tokyo Renka. Now this looks very shoujo-esque. Especially since, you know, you have a presumably girl. Actually, now I think about it, that might not be a girl. And two guys. You know, either setup does kind of suggest a somewhat more female audience um, attraction. She's making love history. So maybe a she. I think that looks a little bit more like a she there. I was just thinking that this could have easily been a guy in a, um, in a thing. I see a region A. I see an English dub. Where's the special features? From the director and studio behind Fruits Basket and Kamisama Kiss, which are both notable shoujos. I'm not seeing any, so let's just you know, dive in. Ooh, different thing underneath the covers. It's always nice to get more anime imagery in your anime releases. So that's an appreciated thing. Hence the, um, the gnome laugh of surprise, I guess. Ooh. Ooh, 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 ooh. Let's see, uh huh. Yeah, we can put that there. Because we've got. 
Yeah, that says Blu-ray 1 there. So that's disc 1. That's disc 2. I've sometimes seen these swapped. It looks like an awful lot of guys. You know, very reverse harem, eh? But it looks like kind of like your standard reverse harem. There are, you know... Well, actually, it's pretty standard in harems. There are, you have what might be your more important two characters, but then you have an entire cast to kind of back them up, to kind of fill things out a bit. Uh, let's see. We've got Chain Chronicle. I'm trying to read that, but I'll be honest, the, um... Yeah, anyways, let's just get this plastic off, because that might make it a little bit easier for me to... The light of... The light of Hysesitas. Hi oh, three movies. This is a three movie thing. No one safe from darkness. Uh, let's see. I see two things. Let's see regions A and B. Twelve episodes on two Blu-ray discs and three movies on two. So this is. Oh, yeah, this is complete series plus three movies. Oh, that's a shit ton of stuff. The complete series plus all three movies. Special features include... CC Chronicle episodes, CC Academy episodes, T-Joy episodes. So in other words, nobody can fucking spell anything, which I think is half the point, of course. CC is Chain Chronicle... I don't know anything about this series. I'm having trouble telling much about it because it, it feels like, you know, because this is set up in such a. Oh, is this is a DVD plus Blu ray set? Uh, no, 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 no. Because so, we should have disc one, and that says Blu ray, and this is disc two, episode 10 to 12 plus special, that's Blu ray, and then we got disc three movies one and movies two, and then we've got. Disc 4, which is movie 3. And no helpful imagery there to discern what this is about. An interesting curiosity. Hmm. Kind of remaining curiosity. So those inserts are not inserting very well. Next up we have Samurai... No. Gakuen Basara Samurai High School. For some reason I thought that said Samurai 2, but I guess because I just woke up from a nap. You know, this looks like a kind of spin-off to the series. And as you can hear, you know, since I'm on PTO and I would have to meet, like, three different things, I am, of course, receiving um, Discord messages. But don't worry about it. we got Region A, 12 episodes on two discs, um, Japanese with English subtitles, and Echo in Mexico. Is that what it says? I'm having trouble actually reading it through the camera. Or kind of in person, but you know, let's just take a peek. Disc 1 and upside down disc 2. Nice and straightforward. Uh, next up is probably the thing I'm looking forward to the most. Setokai Yakuindomo. Um, I mostly recognize this because of a funny scene of her speaking English. If you've seen this before, or you've seen the clip, then you probably know exactly what I'm talking about. And you're like, oh, wow, cool, that's finally out. And that is a particularly gut-bustingly hilarious scene, which means I am kind of looking forward to exploring the series itself. But I do see from the back that it is um, Japanese with English subtitles only, region A only, 26 episodes plus movie on five discs. Wow, there's some real packs. Season 1, 2, movies... Pretty cool when a school has an out of uh, mostly girls and only a handful of guys, things can get a little rough on the male members. I don't know. Could be good, could be bad. I've seen those premises work okay before, and maybe some of that stuff I'm thinking of nostalgically. We'd have to actually see. Okay, so that is actually a one. That looked like a smudge, but it actually says disc one. We've got disc two. Disc 3, Disc 4, and then Disc 5. 
there. It says the movie right there. So this is the movie. Well, you know, it's a pretty straightforward release, but I'm kind of looking forward to checking it out. And then this is probably a pretty notable release because, you know, um, Satoshi Khan's works. Uh, fucking stuff. Satoshi Khan was just, you know, he did. He was such a master. It's too bad we lost him. Millennium Actress. What I really need to rewatch is Perfect Blue. But. Because I think I remember the general idea of Millennium Actress just fine. But if you're not familiar with Satoshi Kon's work, oh, actually, it says it right there on the front, doesn't it? A Satoshi Kon film. Um, he's only worked on a handful of stuff, but he's pretty much really good at just kind of playing with your, the audience's views into what he's watching. With Millennium Actress, kind of... It's pretty much a, an exploration of the history of a famous actress from the point of view of her memories and it's kind of interesting because a lot of his works kind of tend to follow the flow of the idea of what they're dealing with so the story flow is kind of a disjointed sort of memory sort of thing of an entire lifetime whereas other works could be like shifting through dreams or dual livings of realities or a bunch of weird stuff um, but he does a really good job of playing with, um, just your audience view. And even the, kind of his most sane work, which is actually probably my favorite of his, Tokyo Godfathers, it doesn't really... It plays with your expectations visually, storily, in interesting ways. Anyways, here's this week's anime DVD collection update. This is an interesting spread of colors. So I think when it comes to watching anime, there's... Nothing too complicated I've done this past week. I mean, I did finish the first episode of Horror Kind of Receive. And, again, you know, uh, the reason I originally put it down despite, despite not finishing the first episode was just because it was other stuff I was trying to work on. And I guess I'm still kind of focusing on Avatar stuff and VR chat a little bit more than maybe usual. But, um... Black haired girl was being kind of a bitch. And it wasn't totally unwatchable, but it was one of those things where it's just like, uh, I think I'm going to be focusing on this other thing that I'm already partially focusing on, anyways. So, of course, you know, um, it kind of meant just putting off finishing the first episode. And I figured I'd finish it off because our main girl, you know, actually has a pretty fun attitude. I don't know if it's bad. Sport-wise, it seems pretty common sport-wise. You know, one of those common tropes. But it's hard to say if it's definitely good, good beyond that point. It probably is. Was this one? Uh, I guess it was. I'm having trouble remembering because I'm not strictly requiring stuff I'm watching to be dubbed. But, you know, fine first episode. I would have given it more time. But I was kind of curious about some of the stuff that arrived last week. Even though, in the end, I only ended up watching some of... Um, Rascal Does Not Dream of Bunny Girl's Senpai. Just because it's a weird title. I, I do remember looking on the back, maybe seeing it say Puberty Syndrome. And now that I've watched it, I kind of understand why it's saying that. Because I think the anime is supposed to be about that, but at the same time, it isn't really. And... Hmm. Well, what do, what do I think about it? It seems... Okay, I think part of the problem is there's just a lot of interaction between the main character and the girls, which are pretty much the girls insulting them, which is, you know, kind of cute, but at the same time, I don't really find it endearing as I think some people do. I, I know it's out there because, like, Bakemonogatari kind of has um, Senjo Gahara doing that a whole lot, and she's presented as the kind of main love interest in that series, and at the same time... Um, at least with her, you can see stuff bleed through. But there does seem to be this fetishization of the concept to the point where they don't think the writers and the makers understand what they're doing. And what I mean by that is I think of other shows in which they try and kind of portray two 
the, these two characters side by side, but usually there isn't. They they aren't really doing the same thing, even though they're kind of put side by side as if they are. And I think um, Snafu is a really good example of this, where a main character, you know, he says a lot of stupid things like, "Oh well, I." don't think communal things work, that's why I want to be a bear, a solitary creature, ignoring the fact that a bear is not actually a solitary creature, it is actually a clump of billions, trillions, or whatever of cells working together. You know, already the idea that an individualistic thing doesn't necessarily work out in and of itself per se, evolutionarily speaking, and this would be really fucking obvious if he wasn't thinking of a bear as just a entity that exists on its own, but rather understood that bear is part of a continuum, blah, blah, blah. I'm, I'm starting to use words, but the entire point is, you know, he would say stupid things like that, but a lot of his painful comments he would make to other people are painful observations about the situation right now that the character doesn't want to put it that way, but it's not necessarily wrong to put that put it that way per se. Give or take. So, he kind of has this cynical view of the world that is very kind of justified by the thing. But he, when he's placed with other girls who are supposedly, or another girl who's supposedly has the same thing, the real problem is that she just makes shit up. She just calls people ugly, rapists, whatever. I don't know. She doesn't only do, do that, but it's like some of that stuff, if, if, you're, if you're having to make up the reality of what's going on, not just make up this reality of the way things are, which, you know, he's just a mistaken dumbass, but she's outright antagonistic. And I think that's this common thing they tend to do where they don't tend to stick to, oh my god, that is a very cynical but true observation that people don't want to admit. You know, that's, that's kind of fun. And it's really unfortunate that when they put guy-girl pairs together that, you know, the guy tends to be more that the girl tends to be more making shit up. <sighs> I don't even know why that is. I'm wondering if some of that could even be just my own observation of maybe... But anyways, the entire point is when I notice when shows put guys and girls together who are like that, they do tend to make that mistake. And sometimes it's worse than others. And this one... Uh, yeah, not not that bad. It's definitely one of those things where it kind of feels a little like that, but the real problems with the show are kind of similar to the idea of ignoring the actual physical reality of stuff. This show kind of presents ideas, maybe not necessarily as if they could really happen, but kind of basing them on physics ideas that don't actually apply at all to what they're talking about. So, like, the first example... Um, has to do with um, Schrodinger's cat. So, uh, if you're not familiar with that, it's interesting because you do have good videos out there that kind of explain the general concepts perfectly fine. The anime explains some of the concepts at a high level fine, but a lot of these... I guess I'm going to call them... I, I don't know. I was going to say amateur, but some of these aren't amateur because, like, there's this one YouTube video that's really good at explaining some of the ideas of the double slit experiment, experimentation showing that um, the quantum world doesn't behave quite like we thought it would, um, which I guess is trying to lead on to some other metaphysical, spiritual thing, maybe. But it's interesting because it does a really good job of explaining the double slit problem, but then the kind of interesting conclusion from that is similar to the problem with the Schrodinger's cat one here, where um, if you're not familiar with double slit, uh, how to explain it? They, they both have to do with kind of quantum uncertainty and things causing when say, people say the quantum wave collapses, they basically mean it's a wave of probability where the probability could be anywhere within that wave and when it's observed and the air quotes are important there, um, it becomes, for all intents and purposes, exact for that measurement, which is why with double slit, when you have individual, um, I guess, quantums going through the double slit, um, normally if you're firing physical matter through, you expect them to land in two spots where they 
manage to get through the slits. But if you have something like a wave of water and you're measuring water hitting the opposite wall, you get an interference pattern where the waves from the two slits um, interfere with each other or strengthen each other depending on where the waves. So you kind of have this striped band in the background. And when you try to measure which slot um, the particles go through, um, it becomes uh, straightforward and the wave pattern disappears. And the entire point of that and of Schrodinger's cat, which is if you set up a cat in a box with a particle that has a 50% chance of releasing an atom, blah, 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 um, the cat is both alive and dead in the box because the poison has or has not been released until you open the box and the waveform collapses and you see the final state of everything that's in there. But before you've done that, it's that. Now the trick here is the idea of observation in both situations. I mean, the way I handle double slits should be an indication that it's actually about measurement. It's similar to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle where um, that one says you can't know the exact spin or the exact location of an atom or quantum or whatever because in order to measure that you have to use one of those to measure it basically so you're either going to interfere with one or the other in order to find the other piece of property and the idea is that observation in a quantum realm should probably be more seen as observation so Schrodinger's cat in a box is really not about a literal box but rather a conceptual box in which it's not being quantumly interacted with by anything else. It's only once you peek into the box, i.e. look into that isolated quantum state that you find the final state that's in. Or at least that's my understanding of the way all this stuff should be. And because this show kind of doesn't have the right idea, it goes with the idea of observations and literal people seeing things. It then kind of does this thing where it's like, well, the reason the bunny girl was when it wearing a bunny girl costume is because she's realizing that less and less people are actually able to notice that she's actually there. And they try to make it this quantum thing where she's not being observed. And it that that's not the way it works. And to make it even more confusing, it's not even just that she's not observed by absolutely anybody, but rather that people are subconsciously not observing her, so they are forgetting about her, but only her. And it's... The reason I'm harping a little on this is because if it was just mentioned as a one-off concept for the audience to stew on, it could have been interesting if it was just a problem, a mystery they were dealing with, and whether or not that effect had anything to actually do with it or was a good explanation would have been fine but the show really hammers on it which kind of shows that I don't think it really understands it because it doesn't even talk about how it couldn't really be that or our understanding would be wrong but it's it's annoying when you kind of know what it's supposed to be and the show gets the thought experiment wrong we're not even talking about like the physics. Like, let's just accept the fact that th that explanation, as it works, um, works as a model because a model is just something we decide, we define to describe reality. And as long as it gives us good predictive measurements, that means that it's a useful model. It's not necessarily correct. So, for example, a lot of Newtonian mechanics as a concept aren't correct because they are incomplete, but for all intents and purposes they are a perfectly valid model at the scales for which we use them. But once you start dealing with extreme gravities or speeds or whatnot, then the forces that are normally not present and not taken into account with Newtonian mechanics, um, you know, they're, they're not uh, applicable. But that just means that Newtonian mechanics isn't a perfect description of the universe but it's good enough for what we're doing and really general relativity is you know a step above that in concept but we also know where that doesn't quite work measurement wise and like I was with the quantum stuff but the entire point is the definition of correct for these is they are useful models for predicting physics behavior and not necessarily um, you know, the way of things, but they do kind of suggest the way of things as well. 
And I mention this because I've had certainly heard ideas, and I don't have a good clear grasp myself on why they are definitely wrong. But it is possible that our understanding of the quantum world could really change if, you know, something revolutionary came about. And maybe we still use the same descriptions for stuff because they are still useful, but maybe at a different level, quantum mechanics as we understand them gains a different understanding. And, you know, maybe we just find more reasons to trust it more, I guess. And... <clears throat> The next problem that the show started bringing up was Laplace's demon, which I wasn't completely familiar with. And it sounds like philosophically I would have some differences with some of the high-level counter-arguments I've heard to it, but the show of course gets it wrong. Because it's using the idea of Laplace's demon to create a time loop accidentally, which is against the purpose of Laplace's demon, which suggests the characters don't really fucking know what they're talking about. Because, you know, even if they're Japanese and they wouldn't have the word Groundhog Day, they did have the word time loop and they used that, at least in the translated version. And that, as a concept in and of itself, makes more sense instead of trying to say, oh yes, Laplace's demon. Because the idea of Laplace's demon, now he didn't call it a demon, but people attributed it to that because I think there's this, I think there's this fun thing to do where you come up with physics ideas and because you're coming up with kind of more philosophical ideas and not actual real ones, you're saying, okay, well, this exists outside of the realm of physics as we understand it in order to prove something about the realm of physics as we understand it. And, you know, they're, pl they're playing with the laws in ways that maybe shouldn't be. And so I think people like to say demons. I, I remember this one where you kind of, kind of have two chambers and you have a demon in the middle that only lets par certain particles through in order to decrease entropy. What was it? In I think it's decrease entropy. Reverse entropy, yeah. And that's supposed to be an interesting thought experiment, but of course, you know, from a thermodynamics perspective, you know, that can already work where you can have closed systems for which inside that system entropy doesn't increase. I, I, I keep trying to remember which is which because I can get it backwards, but, you know, that, that confuses people because, you know, Thermal dynamics, dynamics say that entropy overall is not, or in a closed system it can't, but certain things that people think are closed systems aren't closed systems, and I think the best example is Earth where they're like, you can't have particles organize themselves in order for life to happen because in a closed system that would require entropy to reverse, and the, there's two things wrong with that, one of those being that within a closed system you can have the entire entropy you know, increasing while small pockets are decreasing, but then in the end, you know, it eventually either stops increasing because maybe you could have a flat line or it just keeps increasing until any organization you thought you had is now completely gone. But the other part is that the Earth is not a closed system. We are actually receiving energy continuously from the sun. And probably other forms, but the energy from the sun is the main example. So anything we would think about in terms of the entropy of the Earth increasing and, you know, the Earth not being able to organize can't apply because the Earth itself is in the closed system. And then when you take the Earth and the Sun as part of a whole solar system, even though there's not a lot of stuff coming in, you do have a lot of energy coming out of the solar system. The entire entropy of it is increasing, I think, and so it's really about the small pockets increasing thing. And eventually, you know, when our sun dies off, if we're, we've not escaped from our solar system, then, you know, that's just a part of the entropy of the Earth, um, you know, eventually increasing. I mean, yeah, it's one of those things where it's always the opposite of whatever I think it is, and so I'm always confused, but the entire point of all that is Laplace's demon is a thought experiment about it, something being able to predict the future if it knew the state of every atom in existence where they were going, what their momentum was, and the show tries to apply it as if something could predict the future wasn't going to be the one that they didn't want to be, so they caused a time loop thing, but they didn't make it that. 
instead it was just kind of your stereotypical, oh, uh, they don't like what's going to happen at the end of this time loop, so they keep going back to the beginning of it. And, um, and it has nothing to do with Laplace's demon. It's really just the show trying to drop the idea, but it's not that interesting because Laplace's demon is about determinism and supposedly the counter-argument I was hearing about it is that thermodynamically you'd be able to undo, um, you know, just things thermally, whatever. And I would say that that's not a good counter-argument because there's an assumption there that there's information that couldn't be known per se. It, does, it isn't necessarily true that Laplace's demon proves that things are completely deterministic per se, especially since you do have the possibility of quantum stuff adding random chance who knows where, but at the same time, that doesn't necessarily disprove it if the probability is actually 100% guaranteed if there's information we don't know that we could know that would make it. And likewise, if you had a bunch of hot chocolate and you poured it into a cup of cold water or something, you know, the idea is the thermal energy spreads everywhere, the molecules spread everywhere, it gets all mixed up, and the thermal dynamic explanation is you can't reverse that, but Laplace's demon actually suggests you probably could. So saying that the cup disproves Laplace's demon is kind of putting the cart before the horse, I would say. Anyways, I guess I've just been going blabbering off about these thoughts, and you should take them on with a grain of salt, you know, I'm, I'm not a physicist, um, especially since, you know, like, I understand some of the things that have led us down certain paths in terms of understanding, of, of our current understanding of quantum physics, but not the full why other things have definitely been disproven. I've seen assertions made that I've never seen any real proof that those assertions are true, because some of those assertions seem to be um, cyclical. It's one of those things where we've got a lot of good suggestions. And Oh, sorry, I'm going off on a tangent again. The point is, you know, take it with a grain of salt. They're, they're all thought experiments, and I've got my own thoughts there, and those could very easily be wrong. So, you know, it's one of those things where it's all fascinating, but I'm not going to be sending any aircraft through the air at faster than the speed of light. And I kind of respect that understanding of stuff to be a little bit better just because we already have to accommodate for gravitational and speed related stuff with um, GPS positioning in order to get the timing of very accurate atomic clocks synced up. And that alone is kind of a pretty good proof that um, the, the ideas of relativity are sound. It's when we have to actually account for them that they're good. And I think the same thing applies to quantum mechanics where our ideas of quantum tunneling and all that stuff um, definitely make it hard for us to make smaller and smaller transistors. But at the same time, I can't help but think that th that one could easily have more explanations. I don't know. Again, I've, I've just had weird thoughts on all this stuff and I just keep going off on that tangent. Otherwise, you know, I'm, I obviously haven't watched a whole lot of anime. Um, I haven't been playing too many games. So, like, I have been playing Pokemon Sword and putting, I guess, time into it. But mostly it's because I kind of enjoy hanging around the wild area and doing Dynamax battle stuff. So I made more progress into the game to make the um, Dynamax battle stuff hard. And I'm now on the verge of wanting to make more progress because I need to get the ability to cross the water areas in there just to have more access to wild area and probably unlock more difficult Dynamax battles and you know maybe one of these days when I do an invite I'll actually see somebody but I'm assuming that because I can solo all the ones I'm doing right now that anybody that's really trying to do the multiplayer ones are probably doing it for harder ones uh, but let's see I currently have five badges and my team is all level 70 in fact I explicitly stopped leveling them at 70 because I was trying to think that since Absolutely all of my Pokemon catching has been by Dynamax battles, and since my main team is absurdly overpowered, I really do need to focus on creating some utility Pokemon to capture Pokemon. And I'm really quite disappointed. It looks like one of the Pokemon that did not make it into the 8th generation is Smeargle. 
And I'm also worried that Ditto isn't there. Just because I haven't seen a Ditto yet. Uh, and sometimes they put the Dittos really late in the game when they are in there, and sometimes they put them surprisingly early. But if there's no Ditto, then... I think a lot of the breeding engineering just doesn't become... It, it becomes very unexciting. I mean, at that point, you're pretty much just saying, eh, just grind for bottle caps. Well, shit. And, um, I haven't quite figured out how to get hidden abilities yet. I'm assuming they're still in there, but for some of these Pokemon, since I've been capturing most of them using, um, Dynamax battles... I, I don't know if chaining is really a thing in here, even though that I was doing chaining earlier on because Snovers were very excellent ways to get quick experience because a high-level Snover could be killed by a low-level fire just because but it was quadruple weak to it. I don't know. Um, but, yeah, obviously I'm enjoying Dynamax battles just because, you know, they're, they're kind of... They're, they almost don't work. But the almost tells you that it's, I think, on the side where I would say it works, at least for me. Um, the thing that almost doesn't work. Well, there's a couple things that almost don't work. One of those is you do have an artificial round limit and a limited number of Pokemon that can faint. You know, it'd be interesting if they could be completely knocked out, but they try to set it up so that once four faints happens, bam, it's all over. And that's kind of dumb just because it really does make it where somebody can be the weak link and their Pokemon can be fainted four times and everybody else does fine and one person could then drag everybody else down. But I guess that could also happen in any raid. Hmm. But once you get to three stars for Dynamax battles, they introduce this artificial cutoff where it doesn't matter how powerful your attacks are, um, their health won't go below that point so that they can set up a shield thing so that they have a number of hits, and those number of hits aren't affected by multi-hit moves, which is a really super artificial way to make the battle difficult. Kind of makes it a three-phase battle. A normal phase, a nothing's happening phase and then a very easy phase because after the shield drops um, their defense and special defense go through the floor and then pretty much anything can knock them out and the computer players are sometimes smart and sometimes dumb about it I can understand why I like that Maractus keeps using um, solar beam because when if my fire type Pokemon actually used a fire type attack and made the Sun incredibly bright, then Solar Beam would be one-shot firing every single time. And, which is unfortunate because it means it doesn't know that I'm actually using fighting type attacks because it's also weak to that and because it probably, because if it has thick fat, it's going to take half damage from the fire stuff which might make it not as effective and the fighting stuff increases everybody's attack by one stage, which is kind of nice. Make everybody a little more beefy. But I, I, I digress. Um, the theming of Dynamax battling is almost inappropriately epic, where it's like it's an epic concept, but the fact that you can keep doing it over and over again kind of makes it silly, especially since there's this little reveal thing that's a doing like a little joking doing which works when the Pokemon that you're facing is a giant dumb looking pigeon that can be one shot by an ice shard but when you're dealing with something that's supposed to look dangerous it doesn't quite work with everything else but it doesn't disrupt everything else for it to not feel epic per se but the thing that makes it not feel epic is the fact that you keep doing these over and over again, and since there's a lot of stuff done for extra dramatic effect, some of it feels unnaturally slowed down a little bit. But again, a lot of this stuff is just a little bit on the wrong side, where there's some of it a little bit on the right side, and the 
for me, the balance works out fine where I enjoy doing Dynamax battles, especially since you do them and you get a shit ton of rewards at the end, most of which are stuff I already have, but, you know, it means I, I kind of don't have the itch to shake berry trees anymore because you just get so many berries doing Dynamax battles. And I haven't made any curries, but, yeah. I have found out that even though a lot of Pokemon are a whole lot easier to catch with Dynamax battles, than you would expect if you used a simple Pokeball on them in battle, even if you reduce them down to 1 HP and put them to sleep, you know, the ultimate increase of catch rate stuff. Um, there, It's not a guaranteed thing. I was wondering if it was a guaranteed thing and if I was just going to keep using Pokeballs, but that stupid Water Turtle's final evolved form, that one's being a stubborn little bitch and refusing to get caught. I've realized after third or fourth one, okay, after the third one probably, that I need to start using Ultra Balls no matter what, and even then it's still not getting caught. Whereas some of the others aren't. Um, it is neat to see Pokemon that when they um, Dynamax, they change. I think um, I've run into three in the wild that are like that, and I think some of the trainers ones do that, but they were all one hit KO'd, so that didn't matter. Um, but I guess the thing is, it's really neat. I think one of the surprising ones was Butterfree pretty much looking like Mothra from Godzilla. That was actually kind of cool. I'm not sure if that was exactly what they were supposed to be, but that's the impression I got. And I'm not a big Godzilla fan, so I'm basing that upon Mothra's appearance in the newer Godzilla movie, Godzilla King of the Monsters. Cool stuff. Anyways... That's a lot of stuff to think about, um, but at this point I am ready to continue on with the story. I'm going to try and reach the point where I'm maybe done with the story. My Pokemon are probably strong enough to beat the Elite Four now. I have perfect type coverage, so the only problem with the team is imperfect type defense, which is pretty impossible to do with a team of six. Your, your Pokemon aren't going to be completely resistant to absolutely every single type out there per se. Eh, maybe you can. You do the right thing with steel. But, um, you know, it, I have all offensive types. And they're actually all per, put on kind of the right Pokemon. If anything, I could use a slightly better physical attack on my main character. Or maybe I'd put it on another Pokemon. But, you know, I do have fighting offense if I really want to use that. I All my physical attacks are on primarily physical attackers. All my special attacks are primarily on special attackers. The only exception is my bug type attack is a physical type attack on a Pokemon that's slightly more special than physical. And because it's leech life, it's good. But, you know, usually you can fall back on other options. Usually it's just great to use if I'm fighting Grass Dark, which happens to be here. I guess Grass Psychic would also be a good opportunity to use it. Things to think about. It's all good, you know, it's a fine little team. With the only problem being that only one character is a new Pokemon because everybody else that was a new Pokemon got replaced by other Pokemon that I knew could do the job those ones were currently doing and better. For example, Yamper was on my team and I replaced it with Gardevoir because I knew Gardevoir could learn Thunderbolt and all Yamper was promising me was a cute dog that looks like a, it's got Pikachu butt and it looks like a hot dog covered with mustard, but um, you know, all it was promising me was electric. And Gardevoir can learn Thunderbolt. And I think I mentioned that last time. So, you know, lots of little weird things like that, but it's all good. Everything's good. I, I, I imagine the remainder of the game is not going to be that tricky. Although it'd be interesting if it did through some loops, but we're talking about Pokemon series here, and this game is... being less... It's not trying as hard to prevent you from doing things. So like, oh, well, you're supposed to go up the elevator in the middle of town, even though eventually you learn there's one off to the side, but they don't want you going off to the one on the side. They have two characters there who are just talking to each other, and for some reason your character is like, you know, I don't want to walk in between them while they're having this conversation, so I'm going to go backwards. Oh, there's Team Yell, and they're just kind of yelling at the entrance, you know. I could, you know, one hit KO them with Guard of War even if all five of them are attacking me at the same time. It doesn't matter. Even though there's only two of them there, it wouldn't matter, but your character's just like, 
I just don't feel like doing anything about it this time. They're, they're not harassing people at a hotel. You know, that's maybe a respectable opinion. You know, there's a time and a place to fight your teams. And I still don't know what I think of Team Yell. I think as a concept, they kind of work if you go with um, kind of the same concept that Score Bunny goes with. Like, I think it is it Score Bunny or Scorch Bunny? I don't know. Because I think we thought of it as Scorch, because, you know, it was the Fire Rabbit, but I think it's Scores, and I think it's supposed to be a soccer, pro, soccer player. I say soccer player for any overseas people, that would be football, and not to be confused with American football. But soccer is a distinct term that I think solidifies that specific football from others, so as long as you understand that, you know, it's actually pretty fun. I don't know what the other ones are supposed to be, because I only put together what score bunny is supposed to be because of its super special attack and I haven't seen the wands for the fire or for the grass and the water ones and I doubt I will because I keep one hit KOing everything oh well. maybe I'll see them Dynamax and I'll be like oh okay that makes sense but there seems to be this kind of football concept just kind of floating around which is kind of funny and I don't mean funny as in laughing at it I mean it's just kind of feels like that's an interesting representation of the area. I don't know. Anyways, I've been blabbering. I've been blabbering. Hopefully we'll actually do some streaming, um, Twitch streaming this week. Because last week we were just, I don't know, a little, a little zoned out. We ended up watching the first episodes for a couple of anime. Except for... Saga of Tanya the Evil. We watched the second episode of that. In particular, I put on the second episode because the first episode, as interesting as it is, doesn't kind of introduce the concept of the anime because that's actually explained in the second. And the second episode is an okay starting place, but I'm babbling on again. Y'all, have a nice week.